Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Evening Jones. All right, if you're watching the e at the eveningjones.com, just need you to log in, use a Twitter profile, whatever. I don't even know how this one works, to be honest. Uh, once you do, you can participate in your chat room. In the chat room, you can also send in your questions. I am uh, trying to think of anything like exciting and adventurous that has happened since the last time I talked to you, but I guess this is just one of them like quarantine uh, type of weeks. Ah. Anyway, I'm still here. Let's get a look at these questions. <clears throat> Do you think you will ever become a morning person, a.k.a. waking up at 7 o'clock in the morning? I mean, I wake up around 7 o'clock in the morning. Now, now, just so you guys know, this question comes up because uh, they're going to broadcast the Olympic opening ceremonies uh, live from Tokyo this summer. They hell been on having these Olympics. But anyway, they're going to broadcast them live, and so the opening ceremony will be broadcast at 6.55 a.m. Eastern. And so I said that I'm not getting up to watch that at 7 o'clock in the morning. That is not the same thing as... I am not awake at 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm down to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, but I'm not scheduling stuff at 7 o'clock in the morning, even if that scheduling is rolling over, getting the remote, and turning on the television. Like, I'm not trying to do anything for recreation that requires me setting an alarm. Because, hey, maybe I wake up as before 7. Maybe I wake up after 7. Right? But I feel like I deserve some room to do that. I ain't doing that for the opening ceremonies. My point was that I don't know how many people are going to do this because NBC has been getting hell from people for a long time because they weren't running the opening ceremonies live. They were running them um, in prime time, right? Like almost like they were running them when most people watch television. But there's always a contingent that wants to watch everything right when it happened because I'm going to find out what happened before it comes on. Like you ain't got no like ability to do I mean, anyway. So they're going to go ahead and broadcast it live. I don't blame them for broadcasting it live because there is an audience of people that want to see it live. I just don't think it's that big a part of the audience. And so what winds up happening is this demand that we have developed because of the technology where we got to know everything that goes on. Like I was thinking about that when I was watching, uh, what's it called? The Social Dilemma. And they're talking about the alerts and how it's just all about tethering you to your phone and making you pull it back out and pull it back out and pull it back out and all of this stuff but one thing i thought about was we can get news faster than we ever got it what exactly does that help you understand what i'm saying like Okay, I found this news out the second it came out. Back in the day, you found out when you opened a newspaper. Has finding these things out immediately done anything to make your life better? Because I do think, while I appreciate and find a lot of news and things that we find entertaining, I have more access to what is ultimately useless information than I ever did. Like, the things that I see that might give me a chuckle, they don't, like, actually do anything for me. They're not, like, making anything better. Sometimes they just wind up making me sad, you know? <laughs> like, it's, it's not like it's telling me, at least in a systemic way, things I don't know. Like, in the individual acts. I mean, individual things, yeah. But, like, in a bigger sense, it's kind of typically reinforcing something that we've already got. But um, we don't need to know all this stuff, like, right when it happens. Like, I don't need to watch the Olympic opening ceremonies right when they happen. Maybe that's just me. Like, I ain't going to lose nothing by watching it at 7 o'clock or whatever time it is that it comes on at night. Like, I'll be good. I'll be just as fine as I ever was. Apparently, for some people, it don't work that way.
Appreciate the question. Let's see what else we got here. Why did De why did Twitter turn the gorilla glue story from jokes to think pieces to think tweets? I am kind of proud of myself. I don't really know much about that story. Um, from what I can tell, a woman used gorilla glue, um, which I use on wood. Um, I'm use gorilla glue to glue, what is it, glue in a wig, a weave on or something like this. Like, I don't really know, I, I don't know the terminology in that world. But apparently a woman used that super duper glue on herself and apparently it turned into a very ridiculous thing. And apparently people got to talking about it. Um, and here's what I think is kind of interesting here, at least in terms of people who are like, why did Twitter do this and turn it from jokes to think pieces or anything else? I have actually seen very few of the think pieces. I have seen very few of the think tweets. And that is without me even uh, having to mute Gorilla Glue. If I were you, though, given that the phrase Gorilla Glue is unlikely to pop up on your timeline in a way that you absolutely need to see. If I were you, I would have muted out Gorilla Glue. Like one thing I do think that happens on social media is that we will find, I've talked about this part before, where we find something one person says and then we turn that into people say and then everybody dunking on the same person in the name of dunking on people because literally one motherfucker in the world says something you didn't like. All right? One one anyway with something like the gorilla glue story people gonna ride it until there's no jokes left or there's going to always be one person who for whatever reason just doesn't think it's funny and that person wants to tell the world that they don't think it's funny. And then there winds up being a backlash and all the depth and all this, you know, and then it just kind of goes um, from there. I think part of what happens and how this stuff winds up going and what I think is kind of interesting, because I have been a participant on Twitter only when I've had a public profile of sorts. Like it's been of a different range at different times, but I've never been on Twitter as a full on rando, right? I've never been on Twitter in a way where I, you know, I didn't know. I've never been on Twitter in a way where I was not acutely aware that there were strangers reading what I was saying. Okay. Like I've always kind of gotten that. I think that for a lot of people, they're on Twitter. And they don't think about anybody else seeing whatever it is that they've said. Like, they almost treat it like a Facebook status. They don't think about this getting in the hands of strangers. Oh, but then it does. And you know why it does? Strangers looking to be mad. Simple as that. So why do you get the, the think pieces and all this stuff, man? Because that's how people like, that's how you make yourself stand out in this large, chaotic conversation. You got to find a way to say the thing that nobody else is saying. And so there's always going to be somebody where like that kind of thinking and stuff is like they hustle or they going to try it, you know? Appreciate the question. Let's see what else we got here. Have you noticed more and more interracial couples and families in commercials? I have noticed more interracial couples and families in commercials. And I feel like the other day I was looking at one of those commercials with an interracial family. And when I say interracial family, I don't even think the kids was of the same race as the parents. Like, I guess they adopted them. That was the way that they was going. I have no idea. But while we ask these questions about there being more and more interracial couples and families in commercials, can I ask y'all a question? Because I, I don't know if I have brought this up in public. I probably have at some point. Um, but maybe somebody here can help me and you'll have a quick answer. 
and you'll be able to put the answer into the chat room for me or something. Okay, you guys ready? You ready? You ready? You ready? You ready? Did they ever give us an answer into how Jeff Goldblum had that black child in that second Jurassic Park movie? Anybody? I've been wondering that for a while. Like, just, and keep in mind, this is 1997. All right, like you ain't just gonna have Jeff Goldblum in a movie with a black child in 1997. That's all, and I'd be like, "What?" Like I actually feel like at the movie theater, whoever was running the film should have pressed pause so everybody could take a moment. Cause like I don't really remember anything that like anything I, as it was happening. I couldn't really pay no attention to nothing that he was talking about with the little child or anything along those lines. Cause I'm like, where did this kid come from? Like that kid, like the only that child could have only been adopted. There ain't a woman in the world black enough to procreate with Jeff Goldblum and come out looking like that. It can't be done. All right. Appreciate the question. See what else we got here. What do you think about the measure Georgia lawmakers introduced to rename the I-75 bridge after Hank Aaron? I did not know that that was being discussed. Um, perhaps the person who asked that question is still here. Somebody else who's familiar with the story can help me out. Um, but is that the Lester Maddox bridge? Because I feel like that's the Lester Maddox bridge. And if that's the less the, the less the Maddox bridge, there will be some unhappy people about that one. Now, here's the thing about the less the Maddox bridge that's always gotten me. Do you know when they named that bridge after less the Maddox? And you have to Google less the Maddox. I can't really explain. It takes me a little too much time to explain it. M A D D O X less the Maddox. Um, they named that bridge after Lester Maddox in 2003. 2003. Like, there was this story that came out about them taking down a Confederate monument in uh, Gwinnett County that was erected in 1993. Yeah, like people decide to flex that symbolic racism hard. This is why when people start talking all that bullshit about how you can't erase history as though like these statues and naming stuff or whatever it is, like they aren't just decisions that people make. Like one day somebody gets up and they come and they put in a resolution. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, hey, we would like this. And there's people vote on it and that's that. Like it's not ordained. It's not enshrined. Appreciate the question. Some guy seems to be really pressed about this time. I went to dinner with a few different people. He says, how'd you wind up at dinner with Hassan Minaj, Shay Serrano, Katie Nolan, and Anna Kendrick? Well, I don't know if you've heard, dude, but I work with Katie. How'd I wind up there? Because I know people. <laughs> like, like this, is, this is, how do you wind up at any dinner? Somebody invites you and you come. Like, what are you looking for? Some of y'all just be pressed to ask stupid questions. Like, these dudes in here talking about, do you still not trust people who love playing Monopoly? What the hell would make that change? Oh, well, you know, I've actually been out here playing Monopoly with a lot of people, and suddenly I found that they're all trustworthy figures. What are you talking about? You 
Anyway, here we go. Does the weekend spend seven million dollars on that halftime show an all time hustling backwards move? Um, I did not dislike that halftime show nearly as much as a lot of you guys uh seemed to dislike it. Like I really didn't. I thought it was all right. Like I don't really rock with his music and I think it was kind of difficult given kind of the tone and tenor of his music. Um that like for that kind of I mean the only song that he's got that I really feel is like the super up beat joint is one of them cocaine songs that came for your face joint, right? Um and so I thought he did all right. I was entertained enough, you know. He uh he did the songs that I recognize. Now, paying seven million dollars for it, this is the question I don't really have an answer for. Like we found out that he paid seven million dollars to put this on. How much does this production cost for anybody else who does it? Like this is the first time I've heard a dollar amount put to the halftime show in the context of what the performer was paying for it. So I don't know, but I wasn't bothered. I thought he did all right. Did you check out the free Britney doc? No, I did not. I don't give a damn about Britney Spears. I didn't give a damn about Britney Spears when she was famous. I have been fascinated to find out how many black people, and I guess it's primarily black women, but still, I have been fascinated to find out like how many black people were like really on board with this Britney Spears thing as it was happening. Because I'm like, man. You want to talk about somebody who was bringing nothing in the booth. Nothing at all. Like, I guess she was out here dancing and that's the kind of things that people was into or whatever. But you are not going to convince me in any way that Britney Spears as an artiste is special. Not possible. Can't do it. Got nothing for you. Appreciate the question. Let's see what else we got here. Should the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame just leave rappers out altogether if their criteria is inconsistent in that genre? Um, Well, I think the tricky thing about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, speaking generally, is this isn't like sports where there's going to be a clear-cut, like, like criteria. So, for example... They just, uh, I think Carol King still is not in. And people were very surprised to find out that Carol King was not in. I was surprised to find out that Carol King was not in. But by and large, in terms of like excellent solo work, Carol King got one album. And it's amazing. It's great. But it's one. You know? And so I could see in some ways how it is that Carol King is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. She's a great and legendary songwriter, but we're talking about something different here. We're not talking about the Songwriters Hall of Fame, right? All right. So Guns N' Roses is really living off of one album. And they are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on it. Now, Guns N' Roses was the biggest thing in the world as this was happening. So I get it. Like, I don't think there's a problem with it. But like figuring out what's the difference between Carole King, uh, her one great album and Guns N' Roses, one great album. What's the difference? No, I mean, you're never going to get like easy answers to this because you're not really going to have quantitative things that you can measure against one another. The issue with rappers in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is not that they are inconsistent with the genre, is that they just don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Like, they don't let rappers in. The idea that Tupac got in before LL Cool J is absurd. That's not to say that putting Tupac in wasn't a problem. It was was a problem. I'm not saying that that was a problem. But... LL Cool J is the first real, like, super-duper solo rap superstar, and he has parlayed it into all these other things. Like, you realize how cold he had to be to parlay that into all these other things? Okay? 
I don't think that they have a voter base that respects rap enough as an art form to think about LL Cool J as a pioneering figure. Instead, they think of LL Cool J as somebody they used to know or somebody they used to listen to once. You know, like, oh, he had some cool songs but not really being immersed in the culture in the way to fully appreciate like what a revolutionary figure that he was. And to me, it is wild that somebody would not get that, especially if they consider themselves some form of music critic. But music critics have never really been put into a position where they really had to take rap seriously as something that's enduring. It was always treated as something that was happening right then. So, like, if you go look at who the pioneering figures are that are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the analogous pioneering figures in rap won't get anywhere near it. What you will get, though, is they're going to vote in like some people that white folks have heard of. You know? Now, here's one thing, though, about rock and roll and the pioneering figures there that wind up getting in. Those writers were largely taking their cues from performers. The performers were telling them who they liked. And then they're like, oh, yeah, these are the legends. It's very similar to this kind of new modern movement of people trying to make Nas as it was written into some retroactive classic, which started happening after Lupe Fiasco said that it was written was one of his favorite records. You know, the Beatles said they love Chuck Berry. It is a resurrection of Chuck Berry. That's what it was. But we rap. There is no like real generation or white rappers that could then go back and tell people, yo, you got to go check out this LL Cool J dude or you got to go check out this Rakim dude. White folks gave up on trying to actually make rap. Like, yeah, you get some Post Malones and some Macklemore's and stuff like that that come out there and actually do it. But white folks treated rap basically like basketball. They're like, okay, y'all got this. Like, we can't even mutate this and turn it into something, you know, that is ours, quote unquote. No, they can't do that. Like, they ain't figured out how to, I guess I was about to say they ain't figured out a way to do basically was the equivalent of, like, turning the blues, you know, starting from the blues and ended up in heavy metal, you know, which is just like the whitest music in the world, right? I can't dance. Nobody gonna dance, you know? But then I guess I forgot about Limp Bizkit, but they're like, oh, no, 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 we're going to rap over heavy metal. (laughs) Boom, gotcha. But yeah, it just seems like those people don't have any actual appreciation for the art form in that way nor do they have a voter base that is representative of people who are legitimately knowledgeable on that front. Appreciate the question. Let's see what else we got here. So your man ain't really going to get the hook impeachment for real is there any benefit of going through the motions as it were yeah there absolutely is i've been watching a lot of that stuff from congress you know i typically try to make a political observations from here but i think if there's something to have been gained from watching that stuff is the raw footage of them folks running up on the capitol because we talked about this when this first happened we were treating this like it was like ha 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 these people are in the capitol doing silly things when it was real as penitentiary still up in there and I don't think that a lot of people fully understand that it was real as penitentiary still up there. And I do think that there, it needs to be documented on the record in that way what it was that happened. Like, that's got to be it. The other thing, and I don't think that this will happen to a degree that will swing this such that Trump will be impeached. Um, but I also think there was something for putting that video up there in the faces of a whole lot of the senators. You know, I think it's easy for a lot of them to just kind of dismiss this and act like it wasn't really happening, you know? But I think once you put that thing up there, like, you know, you're going to get a couple of them where I don't know if they're going to make the vote, but it's going to be hard on their stomachs not doing so. So I think... I think one thing to consider about the time that Trump was there and to keep this in mind with the impeachment is that there were a lot of things that happened that were absolutely like abominable and very little done. And I think a lot of the very little done came up because people were just like. They didn't think they didn't think it's going to do anything. 
right? And so when you need, like, when there's something that you got to push back on that you got to fight back against, you slow it down when you get people believing in the idea, well, ain't nothing going to happen. And even if this is on the back end of the, you know, not even the back end, at the end of the Trump administration, what I don't think you can have is the lasting legacy of the dude's term in office being a feeling that you can do whatever and nothing's going to happen. And so even if it's just going through with a trial, the trial at the very least is something happening. You know? And you just can't have it where people feel like nothing's going to happen. Appreciate the question. Let's see what else you got here. You staying on Twitter if slash when they move to a subscription model. That depends. I am like here for getting some of y'all out of there. Like, that would be great. Like raise your hand if you're not going to pay if they start making you pay. Because I mean if the right people say that then I'll stick around. Um... I got imagined it. I read a little bit about the subscription model, but not a lot. Uh, oh, excuse me. And I think I recall that it's less of like Twitter's going to be a subscription, but it allows you to basically put things behind paywall. Like it sounds like Twitter is doing it in a way that kind of allows you to run a Patreon or something like that off of Twitter. Um, which I think is a good idea. I think that like I think that idea makes sense because if you've already got the people, then it becomes a little bit easier. Like you get into the Substack business doing that. Um you know, so we there. Some dude named Daniel said, you know, you like baiting the dumbass people out there. I don't bait anybody. Like I actually find that to be offensive. I don't like I say what I feel like saying. They act stupid. That's not baiting people. They're just stupid. Which, I mean, if I had to guess, Daniel. Which way is it going? Appreciate the question. Let's see what else we got here. Have you used a product on yourself that left you asking, what the hell did I do that to myself? I, why the hell did I do that to myself? Yeah. Um, it's called Glenmore Vodka. Any of y'all familiar with Glenmo? You used to be able to get a, a, a half gallon of Glenmo um, for $10. And see, my daddy used to keep a bottle of Glenmo gin in the house. And see... I figured that if my dad kept it at the house, it couldn't be but so bad, right? But what I didn't realize was all he drank was Jack Daniels. Therefore, he didn't give a damn what the other stuff was. He just had it there. Right? But again, here I am. Well, my daddy has it. It must not be so bad, you know. And I did not realize at the time what I came to realize as I got older. And I know I'm not the only person who came upon this realization. And that is, there are things where you can get a steal on the price, right? There really aren't that many things where it is like an almost perfectly linear relationship between increasing the price and increasing the quality. Like most times they get over on you. But there are two things where you generally can assume if the price goes up, the quality's going up. One of them 
speakers speakers in general car speakers in specific they ain't really a whole lot of steals on car speakers and the other one is alcohol you are not getting a ten dollar half gallon of liquor that tastes like it's even worth ten dollars and one cents you never will you never will and so i will tell you my glenmore vodka story it's the last time i ever drank out of a plastic bottle i didn't know at the time again as i told you my father led me astray so it was homecoming week my senior year and it was a step show and so my homeboy was working the step show but i was gonna go to the step show and so we started getting right before we rolled out now you got to understand that my man is a much larger gentleman than me but at that point in my life i could i could get busy so we started drinking that Glenmo vodka. And we drank it. And it was, it was Glenmo and cranberry juice. And at first it was pink. And then it was, every, like I was, it was like, take a sip, pour some more Glenmo. Take a sip, pour some more Glenmo. Take a sip, pour some more Glenmo. And so my homeboy left. And I remember I was in my room and my homegirl fell through with somebody. I don't even remember who that somebody was, but I remember it was the first time in my life that the helicopter came. You know about that? You know about the helicopter? Like when it feels like, like, like it's a helicopter. I don't know if it feels like your head is the helicopter blade or it just feels like a helicopter is there, but you know what I'm talking about with the helicopter. And so, this dude says, you have a four loco story. Dude, I'm 40 years old. How many stupid questions are you going to ask, Benjamin Charles? My God. So anyway, I don't remember what time I went to the bathroom. I don't remember what time I started throwing up. I don't remember at what point I laid down on the bathroom floor. I don't remember what time I went to sleep on the bathroom floor. I don't remember what time my asshole roommate sees me laying on the floor and says, I'm going to go stay with my girl. Can you clean this up when you get, when you get finished? Like, can you think of a bigger asshole mood than that? Anyway... At some point, I suppose, I wound up getting back in my bed. And I felt like I got hit by a truck. And the next day, I had a class at Spelman that semester. And I called a professor, because I'd missed some classes already, because I've, I've always felt like class was optional. And so, I missed some classes. I called the professor, trying to let her know I'm not going to come. And I said, well, Professor, um, I just wanted to see what we were doing in class today. And she tells me, oh, yes, you're presenting today. I'm what? I'm presenting. I don't, I swear I didn't remember ever even being, I, nobody told me my presentation was coming, all right? I'm, I'm just here to tell you, nobody told me my presentation was coming. Now, I understand that most of y'all don't have no familiarity with the Atlanta University Center. But for those of you who do, and you could probably Google Earth this, to, if you don't know this, to get a look at this, all right? 
I think it's now called the New Brawley Hall. I don't know the name of it, but when I was in school, the building I lived in was called the Residential Apartments, a.k.a. New Res. New Res was all the way, like, basically one block off of MLK to, to the this way. In the completely opposite way was Spellman. All right? So... What I was telling you was, I had to walk all the way from one end of a college all the way to the other end of that college. And then after I got to the other end of that college, I had to walk from one college to another. And then I had to walk all the way, like halfway across that other college. Hung over off that glimmo. I don't think I've ever felt that terrible. Some dudes named JT says, you got that good F on that presentation. JD, JT, do you realize what I do for a living now? You know what I'm saying? Come on, man. Anyway, appreciate the question. See what we got here. Did you read the Andrew Gillum feature in GQ? I did read the Andrew Gillum feature in GQ. This is the only point that I will make about the Andrew... Well, two points. The big point that I'll make about the Andrew Gillum feature in GQ is that if... He was not ready to tell the whole truth. Then you can't do that interview. And you can't do that interview because Wes Lowry and his two Pulitzer Prizes can't just take your word for it. You know what I mean? Like, they're going to have to check this out. And so the thing was... Wes got in touch with the escort. I don't know what the appropriate term is for the dude that apparently, apparently has sex for money. All right. I don't know what the words are, the lingo that we're using in this case. Um, but one thing that dude wasn't going to go for is Andrew Gillum lying on him. Like folks like that tend to lay low unless you lie on them. And so Gillum and him was like, yeah, okay, cool. Um, and this is like the second point I was going to make. They're like, yeah, I can uh, cop to being bisexual. I got you there, right? And he's like, yeah, I can do that. It's 2021. Folks ain't really tripping so hard on that. And so we have that. But somewhere along the way, Gillum did the calculus that he could still have a political career as a bisexual man but the thing that you can't shake off meth and he's right would I vote for a bisexual I'm sure I've done it before would I vote for somebody using meth yeah, oh, oh, I don't know, man. Like that one's that one's a tough call. But I found it to be the most fascinating thing in this is that a man in his position looked around and said, "Okay, sex with dudes, got that. Alcoholism, I'll own it. People can relate. Meth, there are people who can relate to you using meth, but I don't think they vote." I mean, I could be wrong. Man says, no such thing as a fun functional meth user. There might be, but let me explain something to you, okay? Because there are functional crack users, and people tell you about functional crack users. I've never had anybody really tell me about any kind of meth user. 
because nobody's admitting to using meth. Like, nobody's rolling up on you and just being like, yeah, man, uh, I smoked a little meth last night. Yeah, I just, you know, every few months on my birthday. Nah, 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 you don't hear about that. There are people who would tell you that about rocks. All right, you got to be like in the super circle of trust. Like, but I've heard, I know people who have told me, actually, I don't know anybody that's told me they smoke rocks. Like, I know people who have smoked rocks, but they ain't tell me. Um, ain't nobody really just about to tell you like, yo, man, we're going to get a little meth and chill. Appreciate the question. Let's see what else you got here. be coming to a close. Yep, I got all the way down to have you had a paranormal experience. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Evening Jones. We try to do this thing about once a week, something like that. My man Lance Gilliam handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Remember, if you cannot watch The Evening Jones live, subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the iTunes store. Subscribe at Stitcher Radio. Check us out at SoundCloud. We're at Google Podcasts. And now we are on Spotify. Talk to you guys in a few days. Take it easy.